Uh, my name is Jim Ellsworth. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a lawyer dealing with maritime claims. Uh, my particular speciality is, uh, is, is casualties. Uh, I work for Transport Councillors Limited here in Greece. I moved down to Greece just over a year ago uh, before that, and I still am a representative of Sea Solutions Limited, which is a, a company headquartered in the UK. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about innovative, uh, innovative claims handling. It's the way we think that claims handling should be dealt with and the way that you should think uh, how your claims uh, are dealt with. Uh, we deal with all types of casualties. We've heard today quite a lot about collisions, uh, casualty coordination when collisions happen. They are uh, one of the most expensive type of claims that, that, you will, uh, that you will see, probably second only to wreck removal and, uh, and pollution. We deal with salvage, uh, which Elias was just talking about. This picture actually doesn't relate to salvage. This picture relates to, uh, to, to a scrapping uh, operation. I stuck that there on, in, in, in per, uh, on, on purpose. Um, the new EU scrapping regulations are going to make a huge difference to the maritime industry if they stay as they are. Uh, some of you are going to face a situation where you are not insured for some aspects where if you have a major major casualty involving a EU flagged ship or a major casualty involving a vessel even if it's not EU flagged in a European or close to a European port. So if you want to talk to you about your insurance situation on that type of casualty, uh, please feel free to find me at lunchtime because there are some serious insurance issues that you need to be aware of. Groundings and total losses. Well, this casualty was uh, off the coast of, uh, uh, of the Shetland Islands in Scotland. Uh, I spent four weeks up there when, when this happened. Cargo claims, general average claims, these are the type of claims that are going to cost you lots of money. Uh, insurance and charter party disputes. Well, what they all have in common, all claims have in common, is they are going to cost you money and the way you deal with them will affect the amount of money it costs you. So your, your ethos, the way you consider these things, and the way you deal with these claims is what can make a very big difference to the financial exposure at the end of the day. We think, we believe in innovative claims handling. We think that the same old thinking brings about the same old results. <coughs> if you do it the same way you always did, you will get the same results you always did. You won't make anything any better. And the most important question that you have to ask yourself on any casualty or any claim is what do you want? What are you actually trying to achieve? And that's what you've got to keep in mind. Be very wary when claims become legal that that question, what are you trying to achieve, disappears into the smog. What then happens is they take a life of their own. And instead of deciding what am I trying to achieve in the long run, the importance is what is the next stage in the claim. So we look at taking the evidence, we look at uh, issuing proceedings. Once we've issued proceedings, we've got to do a claim, then we've got to do a defence, then we've got to do discovery. And each one of those sections becomes the answer to what you want, and you're forgetting about the long term. So the biggest question you have to ask yourself is what am I actually trying to achieve here? Where do I want this to go? And not just allow it to get its own legs and to, to wander off in a, in a direction of its own. So I'm going to talk about a few cases, a little bit interactive. Hopefully uh, some of you might answer some questions. Uh, but I'm just going to go run through a few cases where we've just done things slightly differently. I acted for the bare boat charter of a tug. He had a joint venture with an owner. They were trying to get business in a particular port. It went okay, but not as well as they wanted. And two years into the operation, the owner pulled up and pulled his tugs out. The bare boat charterer, he'd signed some contracts and he needed tugs to fulfill his operation. So we arrested the tugs on behalf of the bare boat charter for unpaid cruise wages. We got a significant amount of cash put up security because it was an unsecured loan. We had a very, very difficult, very, very malicious, very, very uh, uh, personal uh, claim between two people who used to be partners. This claim was going to the House of Lords. Neither of them wanted to buckle. I spoke to the owner and I asked him what he wanted, what did he want? 
so that we could solve this claim. His answer was he wanted all of his money back and he wanted interest on his money. Now, that is quite a difficult claim to settle. I asked my tug, uh, uh, the bareboat charterer, what he needed. He said, I need a small tug because I've signed these contracts. I've got to fulfill my obligations under these contracts. So I've got one guy who needs a tug. I've got another guy who will only settle this case if he gets all his money back plus interest. So what we did, we converted the cash security into a loan. My bareboat charterer borrowed the money that was in court. We bought a small tug. We gave the owner a, a, a mortgage on it and we paid him back over six, uh, six years at 6% 6 interest. So my client, the bareboat charterer, he got what he wanted. He got a tug to enable him to fulfill his contracts. And the owner, he got what he wanted. He got all his money back plus interest. It just took five or six years. But the fact of the matter is, by looking at what people wanted, by looking at the goals that people wanted, we were able to achieve a situation where people got what it was they were after without masses and masses of years of litigation with one person winning and one person losing. And let me tell you, in most litigations, the only person who wins is the lawyer. Usually most people, both parties lose. I had a grounding in Cuba. Back in 2001, oil tanker ran aground, was on the beach where the house of uh, Raul Castro was. The, uh, coming up to hurricane season, we were concerned that, uh, that, that there was going to be a pollution event. Uh, Antiliana, the Laco Cuban uh, salvage company, had a contract, uh, and they're very good, bless them, but uh, they, they, they weren't able to deal with a fully laden tanker aground. And our desire, or what we want, was a big tug to go in and assist and pull the vessel uh, off before the hurricane came in. Well, I rang a very close friend of mine at the time and said, how should we deal with it? And he said, don't worry about it, Jim, I'll go and do it. The only problem was the very close friend of mine was a guy called David Perot, and he was a US citizen. And I said to David, how the hell are you gonna go into Cuba and deal with this? He said, don't worry, let me sort that out. David spoke to uh, the, the, the uh, US authorities and got permission for a US flagged tug to go into Cuba and assist this ship. The reason the US authorities uh, agreed that was because we explained to them that if this thing sank, uh, sprang a leak and spilled oil off of Cuba, it wouldn't take long before it was off the Miami coast. We then got permission from the Admiral of the Cuban Navy for a US flag tug to, to, to come in and do this operation. And he was convinced because he knew that that's what we needed and he knew that if he spilled oil on Raul Castro's beach, he wasn't going to be an Admiral very long. So when I decided this, when I said, uh, okay, to, I said to the owner, what we're going to do is we're going to send a US flag team, well, a US flag tug with a US uh, uh, salvage team into Cuba to do this operation. They looked at me and said, are you cra crazy? Are you mad? But the fact of the matter, it was the right thing to do. It solved the problem of what we wanted to do. So if you are a little bit of a sad git like me and you wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh, why don't we send a US tug into Cuba? Don't just ignore that and think it's impossible. Nothing is impossible. If it's the right thing to do, there are ways around it and you achieve your ultimate goal. We had a collision in Greece. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Lloyd's Form salvage contract, but in this collision in Greece, we had a Lloyd's Form salvage contract and uh, the collision happened on a Friday afternoon. Everyone thought it was going to be very serious, very difficult, very complicated. Uh, Monday, Sunday afternoon, the vessels parted. Monday morning, our ship was ready to be re-delivered back to the owner. In that case, I said, no, let's not re-deliver it. Let's carry on with the salvage operation. Let's get the salvage company to bring in a, a, a bulk carrier to enable them to do a, tra a cargo transshipment. And by doing that, by carrying on the salvage operation, or even though it was something that is, that is the no-no in, in, in salvage, as soon as you can get rid of your salvage, oh, let's do it. But in this case, by carrying on the salvage operation, we were able to save quite a lot of money, several million dollars for the, for the owners. 
We had a situation in Ghana where a vessel was aground, benign, uh, benign uh, uh, conditions, and everyone was offering to go and refloat the vessel on commercial terms. Owners have to be very careful dealing with commercial terms because usually then it's the owners that pay and then they've then got to try and recover from the, the, the cargo uh, uh, in general average. So we devised a system where we got the cargo owners to pay up front. And in Singapore, we did a salvage case with a salvor that is known to be flexible so that we could, during the period of, uh, of, the, of the salvage case, change the contract, change the way the contract worked to try and make them try and save money for, for the owners. The quid pro quo was we were making major payments on account to the salvors during the operation so that they were not having to fund the operation themselves. And in a wreck removal case, we did a wreck removal case under a salvage contract. Never been done before, but what it achieved in saving the P&I Club a huge amount of money because we were able to recover from the cargo a proportion of the cargo value in general average. All of these things are just doing things slightly differently. So in summary, because we've only got 12 minutes, don't accept the norm. If someone tells you that's how we always did it, as we heard this morning, that's not necessarily the way we need to do it going forward. We need to change, we need to think about things and don't accept what is normal. Look for opportunities. Remember the question, what are we trying to achieve? Look for win-win situations. Look for situations where everyone is a winner. Be proactive and be fair with your uh, responders. The more you deal with them, the more proactive you are and the more fair you are and the more reasonable you are, the better results you're going to get. So don't let these claims just drag on. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results.